Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it's a privilege to appear before you on behalf of South Africa. My task is to address this court on the new facts and the grave changes in the situation in Rafa that is fast leading to the deadliest phase in this ongoing genocide. Those are the circumstances that compel South Africa to return to the court to seek urgent further or modified provisional measures against Israel. Judges of this court have recognized that the underlying reason for the court's January and March orders was that the very right of existence of the Palestinian population in Gaza is currently at risk of irreparable prejudice and that the only effective way of preserving the right of existence of the protected group is through the function of prevention. South Africa seeks these provisional measures before it's too late for prevention to be possible, let alone effective. This court noted that the situation in Rafa was already perilous in its decision of 16 February. And instead of complying with this court's decisions of January, February and March, Israel has defied this court by trapping, besieging, and bombarding an overcrowded Rafa, exacerbating the security and the safety of a million and a half highly vulnerable Palestinians. Mr. President, no one in Gaza is safe because, as the United Nations has repeatedly made clear, nowhere in Gaza is safe. Palestinians were instructed by Israeli evacuation orders to move south to Rafah and seek refuge there from the bombardment in the north. Yet for months, the expanding population scrambling for refuge in Rafah has been explicitly told by Israel that they are not safe and that Israel does not intend for them to be safe. The international community has witnessed Israeli soldiers preparing for the crowned invasion of Rafah filming themselves, chanting, tear down Rafa. And Israel's intention is typified by statements such as that of Israel's Minister of Finance, Mr. Smotrich, a member of the Security Cabinet, who has explained, and I quote, there are no half measures. Rafa, Dair al-Bala, Nusayrat, total annihilation. You shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. There's no place under heaven. Close quote. Mr. Nukatobi will deal in careful detail with the intention that is so clearly evident in such statements and by Israel's conduct. Now, Israel has resolutely resisted all international efforts to persuade and cajole it from eventually attacking Rafa. As we contemplate the horror of recent events and the significance of Rafa for Israel's ongoing assault, the reminders regrettably of Srebrenica come into view. Rafa's prominence in the eyes of both the Palestinians in Gaza and the international community lies in it being the most visible of the safe areas in Gaza, which has received significant attention in the international media. To paraphrase the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia in a decision endorsed by this court, Israel's spectacular destruction of Rafa, despite the assurances of the international community, including this court, and in the full glare of the international media, is intended by Israel to serve as a potent example to all Palestinians of their vulnerability and their defenselessness in the face of Israeli military forces, and to be emblematic of the fate of all Palestinians in Gaza. To use Mr. Smotrich's words, that there is no place under heaven that they're safe. South Africa, has made clear in its request of 10 May that not only is there nowhere for the one and a half million displaced people and others in Rafa to safely flee, so much of Gaza having been reduced to rubble, but that if Rafa is similarly destroyed, there will be little left of Gaza or prospects for the survival of Palestinian life in the territory. Rafa is where Gaza's largest still partially functioning hospitals are situated. Attacks on Rafa's hospitals akin to those mounted by Israel against hospitals elsewhere in the Strip, would therefore deal a fatal blow to Gaza's already crippled healthcare system. And at the same time as these assaults, aid is being throttled. That throttling is done defiantly and de deliberately. This court ordered on 28 March that, in conformity with its obligations under the Genocide Convention, 
And in view of the worsening conditions of life faced by Palestinians in Gaza, in particular the spread of famine and starvation, that Israel was to take all necessary and effective measures to ensure, without delay, in full cooperation with the United Nations, the unhindered provision at scale by all concerned of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance. That included an express order that Israel increased the capacity and number of land crossing points and maintaining them open for as long as necessary. And Israel was also ordered to ensure with immediate effect that its military does not prevent through any action the delivery of urgently needed humanitarian assistance. Why was that order so critical? Well, because the two border crossings in Rafah, which Israel has seized and shut down, are the main entry points for life-saving humanitarian aid and other goods entering Gaza, and for the entry and exit of people, including humanitarian workers, medics, medical evacuees, and Palestinians trying to flee the conflict. Israel's seizure of those crossings places Israel in control of all access to and from Gaza. Its current closure of the crossings has served to seal Gaza hermetically from the outside world, further torpedoing the delivery of aid to and within Gaza. And as the primary humanitarian hub for assistance in Gaza, if Rafa falls, so too does Gaza. And deliberately herding one and a half million Palestinians into Rafa, and then carrying out a full-scale bombardment while sealing off entry and exit for life-saving aid to an already devastated population, while exposing them to famine and human suffering, leaves only one inference regrettably, and that is of genocidal intent. I turn now to consider the topic of Rafa as a supposed place of refuge. Ten days ago, Rafa was described as the last refuge for Palestinians in Gaza. It was the only remaining area of the Strip which had not yet been substantially destroyed by Israeli attacks. Over the past seven months, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were ordered by Israel to evacuate to Rafa for their safety, some forcibly being displaced for the ninth time. Desperate, terrified, and clinging to life by a thread, these Palestinians have sought shelter, often in makeshift tents or under sheets of scrap plastic, in the tiny and densely crowded city of Rafa, hoping against hope to stay alive in the ongoing Israeli bombardment. A city of children, Rafa has become home to some 600,000 Palestinian children and babies, many of them orphaned or disabled by Israel. And recall that they joined the staggering reality, according to UN Women, that among the dead in Gaza are an estimated 6,000 mothers, leaving 19,000 children orphaned. In addition to being the population center, Rafa is the primary humanitarian hub of Gaza, as I've said, and the only remaining area of the beleaguered strip with the infrastructure and the resources to host the over 1 million displaced Palestinians, albeit in a situation that has been described by the UN as a pressure cooker of despair. But Rafa, Your Excellencies, is no refuge. It's no safe place. On 6 May, Israeli forces ordered around 100,000 Palestinians to evacuate the eastern portion of Rafa. Many were simply unable to flee. Children and elderly people are so starved that they can barely walk. They cannot just relocate to another area, to so-called safe zones. It's just not possible. And even for those who are able to leave, they have nowhere left to go. Yet again, Israel's use of evacuation orders and designation of humanitarian zones are purely performative. They endanger rather than protect civilian life. So-called humanitarian zones are not safe. The zones are policed by the same Israeli forces who have attacked Palestinians in their homes, in makeshift tents, in public markets, schools, and playgrounds in agricultural greenhouses while waiting for aid, by aid dropping from the sky, while attempting to return to their homes, despite waving white flags, and above all else, while sheltering in and seeking treatment from hospitals. Rafa as a place of refuge or safety remains a cruel distortion for another reason, Your Excellencies. For months, Israel threatened to invade Rafa 
leading the UN Secretary General to warn that an assault on Rafa would be a political calamity and a humanitarian nightmare, which was also, of course, highlighted by this court in its decision of 16 February. We are before this court urgently because Palestinians are now having to live out that nightmare. On 7 May, just 15 hours after the evacuation orders were issued, Israel commenced a severe and sustained military assault on Rafah, which is ongoing, and it has intensified in the intervening period until today, killing and injuring Palestinians and destroying their makeshift homes and the remaining infrastructure necessary to sustain life in Gaza, including all aid and medical infrastructure in its path. Israel deliberately attacked the very shelters to which it directed Palestinians to flee. So, Palestinian families in Gaza are left to make an impossible choice. Either they stay, trapped and likely killed alongside their loved ones in Rafa, or they head out into the few bits of remaining land in Gaza, now filling up with tents and shacks, built of bits of wood and nylon and vulnerable to attacks. The overwhelming majority have no means to flee other than on foot. There is nothing humanitarian about these humanitarian zones. Then on 11 May, the Israeli military issued a new round of evacuation orders, affecting some 34 neighborhoods in eastern Rafah and north Gaza. UN agencies estimate in total that approximately 20% of Gaza's population have been displaced yet again in the past week alone. By 10 May, an estimated 110,000 people had fled Rafa. By yesterday, 15 May, this number had increased to around 600,000, according to the UN. And all the while, and now by these actions, Israel's genocide of Palestinians continues through military attacks and man-made starvation and while mocking this court's provisional measures of protecting the rights of Palestinians under the Genocide Convention. A critical part, Your Excellencies, of Israel def Israel's defiance of this court's orders comes in relation to aid and food itself. Israel has seized control of both the Rafa and the Kerem Shalom crossings, taking total control of all entry and exit of people and goods into Gaza as a whole, choking off the two main arteries for getting life-saving aid to Gaza's starving population. And in so doing, it has plunged Gaza into unprecedented levels of humanitarian need, even as compared with the catastrophic levels of the previous seven months that led this court to conclude that famine was setting in back in March. The closure of the crossings means that Palestinians, starving in a full-blown man-made famine, are now further deprived of food, where Israel's attacks have systematically decimated food production systems throughout Gaza. It means that fuel cannot get in to run incubators and life-saving machinery in hospitals, water pumps and wells. It means that people, including the chronically sick and injured, cannot get out of Gaza, and vital aid cannot get into Gaza. And this poses an overwhelmingly grave threat, not only to the Palestinian people, but also to United Nations, personnel and aid workers trying to bring some desperately needed relief. Despite Israel's announcements that it would open Kerem Shalom on 8 May. On 10 May, the UN reported that no supplies were passing through any crossings in southern Gaza. As of 15 May, the Rafah crossing remains closed, and there is a continued lack of safe and logistically viable access to the Kerem Shalom crossing. The crisis could not be more urgent. And that is so where Israel's assaults on Rafah and the closure of these critical crossings are aggravating the famine-like conditions across Gaza where over a million people are predicted to face catastrophe, IPC phase five, food insecurity levels through July, which is just around the corner. Bakeries have been forced to shut down because they don't have fuel. Ongoing attacks in Rafa have rendered humanitarian warehouses inaccessible, and responders providing food aid will run out of food supplies within the coming days. In addition to killing and harming Palestinians, the Israeli assault on Rafa has deliberately inflicted on them conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical and biological destruction. This is starkly illustrated through Israel's destruction of Rafa's hospitals. Due to the ongoing hostilities in its vicinity and the military operation in Rafa, the Al-Najjar Hospital, 
the main medical facility in the entire Rafa government and one of Gaza's large, largest remaining partially functioning hospitals is no longer functional. It was a lifeline for 200 dialysis patients per day whom the World Health Organization previously warned would die if the hospital were to shut down. Fears for the El Emirati Hospital are also particularly acute. This is one of the last partially functioning maternity hospitals in the whole of Gaza, which was until recently handling almost half of Gaza's daily total of 180 births. It has already been forced to stop admitting patients, and medics warn that without a doubt, every single one of the 45 babies in the neonatal intensive care unit and the special intensive care unit will die if the hospital is occupied. And then on 13 May, medical staff at the Kuwaiti hospital in Rafa received an evacuation order from Israeli forces. As one of the last remaining hospitals in Rafa, it had only around 16 beds available for the more than one million people sheltering in Rafa. And its closure will mean the complete collapse of what was the limping health care system in Rafa. Mr. President, allow me to conclude. Israel's ground incursion into Rafa has been described by the United Nations as one of the darkest mornings in this seven-month nightmare. With Rafa's destruction ongoing as South Africa speaks to this court today, the destruction of Gaza itself will be complete. The change in the situation in Gaza and the new facts in Rafa that I have described demand the provisional measures that Ms. Negrali will speak to. The necessity could not be starker. The magnitude and the gravity of the situation facing the Palestinian people in Gaza now exemplified in Rafa. South Africa has thus been motivated to come urgently to this court to prevent the destruction of the final Palestinian government of Gaza with its homes, its hospitals, its schools, its libraries, its businesses, shelters, its mosques, to which Israel has not yet laid complete waste. And South Africa has come as quickly as possible to the court to ensure that the exhausted Palestinian men, women and children who have sought refuge in Rafa are protected from a bloodbath. And it has sought urgent protective relief because of the now pressing need to ensure the survival of the Palestinian people in Gaza as a group and their protection from further harm, starvation, disease and death by Israel's closure of the Rafa and Kerem Shalom crossings, fatally impacting the so desperately needed delivery of life-saving humanitarian aid, basic services and medical assistance across Gaza. But Israel's genocidal acts in Rafa, Mr. President, and distinguished members of the court cannot be understood without appreciating the overall genocidal context in which Israel's Rafa operation is embedded. My colleague, Dr. Hassim, will outline this along with the crippling effects of Rafa now on harrowing display across the Gaza Strip as a whole. I thank you, Mr. President. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on Africa's geopolitics, economy, and changing landscape. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, African politics, economy, and increasing power. Let's continue now. <clears throat> Mr. President and members of the court, it is a privilege to appear on behalf of South Africa. Today's request for the indication of further provisional measures and or the modification of the existing measures has been triggered by the military assault of Israel on Rafa which began on the 6th and 7th of May 2024 and has intensified and escalated since. As shown by Mr. Duplessis and Ms. Hassim, the military attack is genocidal in its pattern. I shall demonstrate that it is also consistent with the explicit, stated, and continuing genocidal intent of the State of Israel. Firstly, to the knowledge of Israel, Rafa is the last refuge of Gaza, the only remaining area in the Gaza Strip which has not been substantially destroyed by Israel, the only area that can host displaced people, the only remaining center of humanitarian aid, and the host to one of the few remaining large hospitals across the entirety of Gaza. 
Rafah is the last stage of the total annihilation of Palestinian life. Without Rafah, the possibility to rebuild and reconstruct Palestinian life will be lost forever. For Palestinians to continue to exist as a protected group under the Genocide Convention, they need a place from which to rebuild. As we stand here today, Rafah is that place, the last stand. Secondly, Israel also knows of explicit warnings about the genocidal consequences of an attack in Rafah. On 6 May 2024, the Director General of the World Health Organization warned that a full military incursion into Rafah will plunge the crisis into unprecedented levels of humanitarian need. On 8 May 2024, two days after the military attack had begun, he stressed that one of the three hospitals in Rafah, Al-Najjar, was no longer functioning due to the ongoing hostilities in its vicinity and the military operation in Rafah. Since the border was closed, the United Nations was prevented from bringing fuel without which all humanitarian operations would stop. Martin Griffiths, the United Nations Relief Chief, has rung alarm bells. He has warned that the simplest truth is that a ground operation in Rafah will be nothing short of a tragedy beyond words. No humanitarian plan can counter that. The rest is detail. Palestinians do not need any more diplomatic gesturing, no more abstract words, no more virtuous condemnations and denunciations of Israel's actions. There is no more time to spare. It is simply now or never. Israel has knowledge of the pronouncements I have cited above. After all, each of them was made publicly. Thirdly, the state of Israel knows of the decisions of this court, which bear on it as a state party to the Genocide Convention directly and require of it to respect its obligations under the Convention and the moral and legal authority of this court. The decision of this court on 26 January 2024 noted that the civilian population in the Gaza Strip is extremely vulnerable and that the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip is at serious risk of deteriorating further before this court renders its final judgment. Bearing this in mind, the court recognized that the military operation conducted by Israel after 7 October 2023 has resulted in Ta'elia in tens of thousands of deaths and injuries and the destruction of homes, schools, medical facilities and other vital infrastructure, as well as displacement on a massive scale. In light of this situation, Israel was ordered to ensure with immediate effect that its military does not commit any acts that fall within Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. One of the measures indicated expressly required of Israel to take all measures within its power to prevent and punish the direct and public incitement to commit genocide in relation to members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. In the decision of 16 February 2024, this court was compelled to demand that Israel immediately and effectively implements the court's order of 26 January 2024. This court cautioned that the most recent developments in the Gaza Strip, and in Rafa in particular, would exponentially increase what is already a humanitarian nightmare with untold regional consequences. In the order of 28 March 2024, this court observed with regret the existence of exceptionally grave circumstances since its order of 26 January 2024 and its decision of 16 February 2024 that the catastrophic living conditions of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip had deteriorated further, in particular in view of the prolonged and widespread deprivation of food and other basic necessities to which the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have been subjected. The court issued its orders clearly highlighting the worsening conditions of life faced by Palestinians in Gaza. Israel was ordered to ensure with immediate effect 
that its military, through any action, does not commit acts which violate the rights of Palestinians under the Genocide Convention. So far, Mr. President, what I have said is not inference, not imputation. It is direct knowledge which bears on the state of Israel, its political leaders, and the members of its army. They know about Rafa and its centrality to the sustenance of Palestinian life at the present moment. They know the views of the organs of the United Nations about the consequences of a milita military attack on Rafa. They know what this court has ordered on each of the three occasions I have referenced. Yet, Israel's leaders have continued to incite genocide and to express their own genocidal intent. In doing so, not only has Israel ignored its obligations as a state party to the Genocide Convention, it has also treated this court with contempt and threatened the rule of law. Let me demonstrate this. Members of the Israeli Ministerial Committee on National Security Affairs and the War Cabinet have simply continued with incitement to genocide. First, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is a member of the War Cabinet and the Security Cabinet, has gone beyond any reference to Hamas alone. Instead, he has des described Israel's aims in the military assault as being to ensure that Gaza will never again constitute a threat to Israel. He describes Israel's objective as being to achieve total victory, underscoring that no force in the world will stop us. We will stand alone, emphasizing that Israel will fight, will fight with its fingernails. Second, the Israeli Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, a member of both the War Cabinet and the Security Cabinet, has made it clear that Israel is taking apart neighborhood after neighborhood and will reach every location in Gaza. Third, the Isra Israeli Minister of Finance, Bezalel Smotrich, a member of the Security Cabinet, has asserted in terms, there are no half measures, Rafa, Dei Al-Bala, Nusrat, total annihilation. He goes on to say, we are negotiating with the ones that should not have existed for a long time. For Israeli members of cabinet, it is as if there is no court order which binds them. They are not the only ones, regrettably. In an interview broadcast on Israeli television on 3 May 2024, the vice chair of the international arm of the Likud party, the party to, who, to which the Israeli prime minister belongs, stated, I think we needed to invade Rafa yesterday to go in and to get them. There are no uninvolved. We need to go in and kill and kill and kill. We need to kill them before they kill us. Taking their cue from the politicians, the Israeli army officials have followed suit in entrenching the incitement to genocide and showing their contempt for this court. The Israeli Army Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Hezi Halevi, stated following the Israeli army siege and destruction of Al Shifa Hospital in March 2024, here is the realization of an impressive strategy. There is a very, very important message here. A hospital is not a safe place. He described the operation as a very high achievement. That is notwithstanding eyewitness reports of hundreds of civilians having been killed by Israeli troops in the hospital, including patients shot dead in their hospital beds. Mass graves and hundreds of Palestinian bodies were found following the withdrawal of the Israeli army from Al Shifa Hospital, including bodies with canulas in their arms, some with their limbs tied. Brigadier General David Bar Khalifa, commander of the 36th Armored Division of the Israeli Army, issued a letter to Israeli soldiers about to deploy in Gaza, exhorting them to continue the killing of Palestinians. 
What has been will be no more. We shall go out to it in war. We shall pulverize every accursed plot of land from which it came. We shall destroy it and the memory of it. Brigadier Khalifa has faced no investigations, nor has he been relieved of his command. This is despite the explicit order of this court for investigations into cases of incitement to genocide. Brigadier Khalifa was in fact promoted to the rank of major and the head of the Israeli Army Personnel Division. Similarly, when 130 senior officers in, is, in the Israeli army penned a letter calling on Israel's war cabinet to not allow humanitarian suppliers, supplies and the operation of hospitals in Gaza, they were not charged with incitement or prosecuted. One of the officers would later be named as involved in the killing of World Central Kitchen workers. Genocidal rhetoric is not punished but rewarded by the Israeli government. On 6 March 2024, reservist First Sergeant Yashin, a veteran from the April 1948 Der Yassin massacre of at least 250 Palestinians, was rewarded with a certificate of thanks and commemoration by the Israeli president for his motivational speeches he gave to Israeli soldiers as they prepared for the ground invasion of Gaza in October 2023. In at least one of those speeches, he had said, erase the memory of them, erase them, their families, mothers, and children. These animals can no longer live. In his speech at the award ceremony, Israeli President Herzog told the senior reservists, including Ezra Yachin, that you have been a tremendous personal example for generations of Israel citizens and the whole world. And I want to, on behalf of all the Israeli people, to say to you, thank you. In their destruction of Rafa, Israeli soldiers deployed to Gaza continue to invoke the Prime Minister's speeches, which are themselves genocidal. In case what I've said is not clear enough, let us hear them in their own words. The destruction of Gaza and Palestinian life is understood by commanders and soldiers, as the video shows. An Israeli soldier from the 9203 Battalion commented as follows on photographs and footage he posted online of Palestinian homes and neighborhoods in Khan Yunis completely destroyed by the Israeli army. This year, we were honored to fulfill the command of the annihilation of Amalek, and may we finish the job. Such language continues to be widespread alongside calls by Israeli soldiers on the ground to conquer Gaza, to flatten Gaza, to erase Gaza, to destroy Gaza, and after that, Ramallah also. Israeli soldiers serving in Gaza continue to openly call for the deaths to Arabs declaring, may you burn alive, that Gaza is burning, that we will burn your mother, and that all of Sajaiya will burn in flames. The aims of Israel is to do no less than what its own Minister of Finance has stated. That is to ensure the total annihilation of Palestinians that will erase the memory of Amalek. He has also called for Rafa to be completely conquered, and the sooner, the better. Israel's genocidal intent continues to receive support and endorsement at the Knesset. 
As Tony Kotlib, a member of the Knesset and the Prime Minister's party, has stated, to attack Rafa as we attacked in the Northern Strip, unlike the responder, intentionally, not specifically addressing, but rather the entire Rafa system, to attack mercilessly from the air, instead of turning an eye to the Hague court, turn an eye to the people of Israel. Public statements such as this show that even members of the Israeli parliament are fully aware of the orders of this court, but have continued to openly incite genocide without censure. Such sentiments are also widely expressed across Israeli society. Many Israelis, including Israelis living in illegal settlements in the West Bank, have actioned statements by government officials calling for the denial of aid to Gaza. By destroying food aid on its way, including setting trucks on fire, putting sugar in tanks, and destroying the food itself. Israeli public officials, including singers inciting to genocide in Gaza, have had their incitement rewarded. One singer who popularized and adapted to Israel's current military operations in Gaza, the racist Israel football chant, May Your Village Ban, changed it to May Gaza Be Erased, and singing it to Israeli soldiers in live performances was presented with a certificate of appreciation for his work for the IDF soldiers during the war by the Deputy Speaker of Knesset, hosted by Israel's Minister of Social Equality and the Advancement of Women. Another singer referenced by South Africa before this court in the January 2024 application for his call to erase Gaza and not to leave a single person there has similarly been rewarded. Both were brought to the attention of Israeli authorities in South Africa's application and pleadings before this court. Neither of them nor any of the other Israeli officials and civilians inciting to genocide against the Palestinians have been prosecuted, much less punished. The genocidal acts described in South Africa's application were foreseen and foreseeable from the onset. Israel's intent was always to destroy Palestinian life and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Rafa is the final stand. Without Rafa, there is, no, there is no more Palestinian life in Gaza to speak of, no more Palestinian identity, and no possibility of reconstruction. Mr. President, the rule of law can only survive through the orders of this court. If the rule of law is to have any meaning, let it be today and with this case. It is no longer enough to order unhindered access to humanitarian aid when it is in fact the military operation in Gaza that is preventing it. It is no longer enough to encourage compliance with the peremptory precepts of the Genocide Convention when Israel's deliberate contempt for the international rule of law has been so plain and so public. Do you think more nations should also show courage like South Africa did? Are you proud of South Africa's actions? Why did other nations that speak more of human rights fail to take this basic step? Let us know in the comment section if only African nations have taken the Palestine matter seriously. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, African politics, economy, and increasing power. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Like and share the video, and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our African videos. It's the best way to support us.